In this episode, I would like to discuss helmets. Given the time limits and need for prioritization of your studies, I would like to give some important clinical and test taking skills, I should call them, to kind of simplify this subject. So first and foremost, if you don't have time, don't sweat all the details, for example, regarding the life cycle and pathogenesis, but have some clear idea, for example, to know which one of them is an intestinal or gastrointestinal infection and which one is the type of tissue infestation. Second point is, if possible, know the different important helmets in each group of nematodes, cestodes, or trematodes. In other words, know the classification because that will come handy when we discuss the management, either diagnostic tests or treatment. This brings me to the next important general rule, and that's know the principles or default diagnostic tests and default treatment options and then try to add to that knowledge the information about the exceptions. Let me give you an example. Trematodes and cestodes are managed by presequantal, while nematodes are mostly managed by a type of bendazole. So this simplification of management just helps you answer the management question for 25 different types of helminth infections. And finally, Try to know one or two specific facts either regarding the pathogenesis or clinical manifestations or diagnostic findings for each one of them. And so that's the purpose of this presentation. Okay, with this intro, I want to start the high yield questions now. Again, the introduction that I discussed the general rules is the most high yield part of learning about helmets. So I would like you to follow my three-tier approach to helminth infections. It's again a simple Venn diagram that if you combine them, the overlap will give you the net diagnosis. One is mode of transmission, two is presence or absence of eosinophilia, and three is one or two, if you can, specific finding either clinical or in lab workout that helps further diagnostic process for the helmet. Then you just need to follow the general rules of management, knowing in the back of your mind the exceptions to the management. With this framework in mind, let's start discussing our first category, which is roundworms or nematodes. Okay, beginning with our biggest group nematodes or roundworms, we have two types of nematodes which are either intestinal or tissue nematodes. So true or false, all intestinal nematodes are transmitted by larval penetration and all tissue nematodes are transmitted by eggs. That's false. Either groups of either intestinal or tissue nematodes have the ones transmitted by larval penetration and the ones by egg ingestion. Again, I cannot emphasize enough that larval versus egg as mode of transmission is not helpful to distinguish between intestinal or tissue nematodes, but we still need to know the categories and mode of transmission. We need to know both classifications. Okay, what are the intestinal nematodes? They are Ascaris lombricoides or common roundworm, Anthrobius vermicularis or pinworm, Trichuris trichura or Trichuris trichura, also known as whipworm. Then we have hookworms, threadworm or strongyloides, and Trichinella spiralis, as well as Anisakis. You, you remember my three tier system of diagnosis, mode of transmission eosinophilia, and one or two specific findings. Okay, let's go through that for the intestinal nematodes. What intestinal nematodes are transmitted by egg ingestion? Remember, Ascaris, Enterobius vermicularis, and Trichuris trichura or whipworm. 
which ones are transmitted by larva remember tertianella and insuccus hookworms and strongyloides are transmitted by larva now if you want to be more specific which one of the intestinal nematodes are transmitted by larva penetration versus larva ingestion Remember, Trichinella spiralis and Anisakis are transmitted by larval ingestion, while hookworms, including Ancelostoma duodenale and Nicotora americanus, as well as Astrangeloides, are transmitted by larval penetration of the skin. Okay, so this is one aspect of life cycle that is clinical relevant for diagnosis. The other aspect of life cycle deals with eosinophilia. You may be asked, what intestinal nematodes are associated with a strong eosinophilia or you might be asked what intestinal nematodes have the life cycle that includes skin blood lung and intestine these are both the same as you know by definition when a helminth gets access to bloodstream it causes eosinophilia and so the answer to this is ascaris lumbricoides and the larval transmitted intestinal nematodes, hookworms, and astringyloides. Pay attention to the fact that the larvally transmitted intestinal nematodes that are transmitted by ingestion of larva, these are Trichinella spiralis and anisakis, are not necessarily associated with the strong eosinophilia. And also the intestinal nematodes that are transmitted by egg but the mature worm resides in large intestine commonly the cecum which include queen worm the Antrobius vermicularis as well as the whip worm Trichuris trichira these are not also associated with strong eosinophilia okay so think in terms of life cycle where the penetration to lung occurs with bloodstream involvement or if the mature worm stays in the large intestine and you will be able to analyze presence or absence of eosinophilia. I find it a better way than pure memorization. Now, if you are asked in general what nematodes are associated with eosinophilia, remember these three intestinal nematodes that we mentioned, Ascaris lumbricoides as well as Astringyloides and hookworms, but also remember most of the tissue nematodes, but most specifically those associated with larva migrants, either cutaneous or visceral larva migrants, are associated with a strong eosinophilia. We will cover them later. Now, talking about eosinophilia, we have a specific syndrome of pulmonary eosinophilia. What is it and what nematodes are most commonly associated with it? This is the Loeffler syndrome and most commonly hookworms as well as Ascaris lumbricoides are manifesting this but again remember any helminth that can cause access to bloodstream and eosinophilia as a result could be associated with pulmonary eosinophilia if they go to the lung in their life cycle okay once more do you remember where is the location of the mature worm in intestinal nematodes remember by definition the common rule is all of them stay in the small intestine and the exception is pinworm and whipworm Anthrobius vermicularis and Trichuris trichura these stay in the cecum and colon again why is this important again this is aspect of this is an aspect of the life cycle but it's important to understand their clinical symptoms so let us go to the third tier of diagnosis and that is a specific findings let's start with enterobius and whipworm what is the specific finding in enterobius vermicularis well regional or anal pruritus what's the specific finding seen with the whipworm trichuris trichura rectal prolapse again remember this similar to enterobius is the only one that stays in the rectum or large intestine rectal prolapse diarrhea and dysentery Again, we are in the territory of one or two specific findings. Now, we have an intestinal nematode or a patient manifesting the unspecific findings of helminth infestations such as abdominal pain, 
and possible changes in bowel movements. And you are said that the patient has either intestinal obstructive symptoms or cholestatic symptoms. And you are asked what other findings is likely in this patient. Well, remember, combination of eosinophilia plus cholestasis and intestinal obstruction is the hallmark of ascaris lumbricoides or ascariasis. And so if you're asked what other findings are possible, one is respiratory eosinophilia or the Loeffler syndrome. And if you are asked what will be the shape of eggs, remember the shape of eggs for ascaris is ovoid. Now, if you have a child with rectal pruritus and suspicion of helminth infestation, what's the next step in the workup? Remember, this is that presentation of pinworm or Anthribus vermicularis. Next step for diagnosis is cellulose tape test. Next case is a patient with unspecific abdominal symptoms as well as myalgia. History is significant for consumption of undercooked pork. What is the diagnosis? Trichinella spiralis. True or false, Trichinella spiralis does not cause eosinophilia. That's false. I would like you to remember that all nematodes that are transmitted by larva, either larva ingestion or larval penetration of the skin, are associated with eosinophilia. This brings us to another nematode, which is kind of a bridge between intestinal and tissue nematodes and that is anisakis. Why is it so? Anisakis causes intestinal infestation but also can rarely penetrate the intestinal mucosa and cause visceral larva migrants which is typical for the tissue nematodes. Describe the typical patient of anisakis. If you have a patient from either Japan, United States or Netherlands with unspecific uh, GI symptoms and eosinophilia. The patient provides history of undercooked fish consumption. You are asked what is the next step in the management of this patient. Remember, this is one exception to the rule that says all intestinal nematodes are treated by bendazoles. Anisakis requires surgical removal. Also, if you are asked what is the gold standard for diagnosis of anisakis, it is endoscopic surgery. What is the finding in endoscopic surgery? Remember, I mentioned that anisakis can cause visceral larva migrants. It means it can kind of creep in the intestinal wall. So we can see the larva in the submucosa of the GI tract, and this is very specific for anisakis. Once more, treatment is surgical, not medical. So you see I'm saying nematodes are managed by bendazole such as albendazole or mebendazole, but this is the first exception. Okay, next we have a patient with iron deficiency, anemia, rash and pruritus, as well as eosinophilia. History is significant for several hiking trips but is otherwise unspecific. What is the most likely diagnosis? Pay attention to the fact that among all intestinal nematodes, the hookworms, the Ancylostoma duodenale, as well as Necator americanus, are the ones most likely associated with iron deficiency, anemia, and protein malnutrition, as well as severe eosinophilia, rash, and pruritus. Mode of transmission is by larval penetration of the bare skin. Now, important question is, if you are dealing with any type of nematode or helminth infestation with eosinophilia, and you are said to perform a stool exam, and the stool exam comes back positive for presence of larva in stool, not just eggs in stool, what are the differential diagnoses? Please remember, among nematodes, hookworms, could have both partially embryonated or partially hatched eggs in stool and strongyloides definitely has primary or rhabdidiform larva in the stool. So these two are associated with presence of larva in stool. This brings us to the next question. Next 
we have an immunocompromised patient with colitis, dysentery, and eosinophilia who is in respiratory distress and his blood pressures are dropping. What are the differential diagnosis considerations in this patient? Well, first of all, you need to consider all the causes of diarrhea among the immunocompromised. However, this specific patient has eosinophilia, respiratory distress, and shock. Eosinophilia should ring a bell for some sort of parasitic infection, and among them, the one that can cause dysentery is most likely Strongyloides stercolaris. You are asked about diagnostic workup and management of this patient. Remember, as we mentioned, stool exam will show the primary rhabdidiform larva, and this is because of the very specific life cycle of the strongyloides that includes auto-infection and reinfection. If the larva are not seen in the stool, what should be performed? Serologic assessment. Now, another exception in the management of strongyloides is the fact that drug of choice is ivermectin and not bendazoles necessarily, even though bendazoles are still useful. Remember what other intestinal nematode can cause diarrhea and dysentery? That is Trichuris trichura. However, in that case, we can have rectal prolapse and eosinophilia is not as marked as seen in astringyloides and the patients are not necessarily immunocompromised. Once more, do you remember which one of the intestinal nematodes have barrel-shaped eggs and which one have ovoid eggs in their stool exam? Remember, barrel-shaped is the Tercuris trichura, the whipworm, while the ovoid eggs is seen with ascariosis. Okay, let's move from intestinal nematodes to tissue nematodes. Okay, next is tissue nematodes, one of those subjects that many of us may not have ever really studied it or understood it because it's not very common but we need to once for and for good take care of them and so I want you to just remember this we have two main groups of diseases associated with tissue nematodes and again it requires some very basic fundamental understanding of the life cycle so one group of these diseases are transmitted by the larva that is kind of injected or ingested to humans and then most commonly the mature adult worm causes the symptoms and the other group is the one that's due to egg transmission to humans and this is the one that is called larva migrants so true or false larva migrants is any type of disease by tissue nematodes that's false only those diseases in which humans are accidental host through exposure and ingestion of the eggs commonly of zoonotic nematodes are referred to as larva migrants in a more simplistic way i want you to think of two group of diseases that are attributable to tissue nematodes one is filariasis and the other is larva migrants so what does filariasis mean Filariasis simply means presence of these motile embryos of tissue nematodes called microfilaria in different tissues. Don't confuse these motile embryos called microfilaria with the first and second stage larva of nematodes called rhabdidiform versus filariform larva. This brings us to the next question, what is larva migrants? Larva migrans is a disease caused by presence of filariform larva in either subcutaneous tissue or different viscera. If it is in the subcutaneous tissue, it is called cutaneous larva migrans or creeping eruption. If it is in the viscera, it's called visceral larva migrans. For example, if it is in the eye, it is called ocular larva migrans, etc., etc. What's the major difference between the filariasis and larva migrants in terms of mode of transmission? The filariasis type of tissue nematode infection is transmitted most commonly by vectors. 
while the larva migrants is transmitted as i mentioned by exposure and usually consumption of the soil contaminated by egg so which type of the tissue nematode infections are considered a zoonotic disease larva migrants and why is it so that's because it's transmitted through human consumption of the food that's contaminated by soil containing animal feces and the eggs okay let's go briefly through different possible manifestations of this tissue nematodes beginning with three common types of filarial infection remember filarial infection or presence of microfilaria in tissue requires a vector first case is an immigrant from africa who has fever and lower extremity lymphangitis blood workup also shows eosinophilia well every time they tell you blood workup shows eosinophilia this is a way to guide you to think in terms of some parasitic infection the question is what's the diagnosis and what is the workup well the diagnosis is most likely elephantiasis type filariasis that acutely manifests as lymphangitis and fever and chronically manifests as lymphedema and lower extremity swelling plus possibility of respiratory eosinophilia uh, pulmonary eosinophilia like Loeffler syndrome now if you are asked what's the diagnosis and treatment always remember for elephantiasis type filariasis diagnosis is made by peripheral blood smear and treatment is diethylcarbamazine now do you remember the agents i i'm not specifically asking about the vector in the case of elephantiasis it's just a type of mosquito in africa but what are the parasites remember uh, vuchereria bancrofti and brugia malai and also there is a newer type which is timori next you have a patient who has immigrated from drc and complains of visual problems in the physical exam you have found some skin nodules what is the vector for his disease remember we mentioned drc or democratic republic of congo is a country that contains congo river and so we are thinking about one of those fast streams providing a great environment for black fly that ingests the microfilaria and injects the larva into human hosts remember what's the disease this is oncocerca volvulus or african river blindness what are the possible findings in eye exam remember keratitis anterior uveitis and chorioretinitis remember slit lamp eye exam also may show what may show microfilarial motile embryos in the anterior chamber true or false slit lamp exam is the gold standard for diagnosis of african river blindness that's false skin nodule snip biopsy is gold standard what is the treatment it's ivermectin usually for years now how do we differentiate african river blindness with african eye worm remember in african river blindness or oncocerca volvulus eye is involved by the microfilaria while the adult worm affects skin in the form of nodules while in african eye move african eye worm excuse me called loa loa or the disease that's referred to as loiasis the adult worm itself can be seen in conjunctiva or subconjunctival tissue in addition to subcutaneous tissue that manifests with pruritus and hypersensitivity reaction again can you compare and contrast their vectors yes the vector of african river blindness oncocerca volvulus is black fly along the fast river streams while that of african eye worm or loiasis is mango or deer fly how the diagnosis differ while the diagnosis of african river blindness or oncocerca is made by skin snip biopsy and 
visualization of microfilaria in the anterior chamber, the diagnosis of loiasis or African eye worm is made by direct observation of the adult worm, either in subcutaneous tissue or conjunctiva. What is the treatment? Treatment for African eye worm or Lualoa is diethylcarbamazine. Remember any other condition treated by diethylcarbamazine? Yes, the elephantiasis mediated by Buscheraria bancrofti or Brugia malari. Put it simple, we treat the filarial infections with diethylcarbamazine except for African river blindness that's treated by ivermectin, a drug that has saved millions of people's eyesight. <coughs> now we mentioned one other type of tissue nematodes that can be transmitted by consumption and not injection of larva, but by consumption of the vector that contains the larva. And again, you expect to see the adult worm in skin. What is this condition? Condition associated with consumption of water containing copepod vector is guinea worm or Dracunculo mediensis. Again, what's the common manifestation? Skin blisters containing the worm. How this condition is treated. This condition is treated by slow removal of the worm around a stick. Okay, let's finally turn our attention to the larva migrants. What parasites are responsible for them? Accidental infection of human by either cat or dog ascarids or cat or dog hookworms. More specifically, what are the agents of Creeping eruption and what pathogens cause visceral larva migrants. Creeping eruption or cutaneous larva migrants is mediated by dog or cat hookworms, while visceral and ocular larva migrants are mediated by dog or cat ascarids, referred to as Toxocara catti and Toxocara cani. Describe the typical case presentation of cutaneous larva migrants. A patient with pruritic papule followed by serpentine lesions along the path of migration of this larva and pay attention that here it's the larva that's immigrating, migrating and not the adult worm. After exposure to cat or dog feces in soil. This is the typical case of creeping eruption or cutaneous larva migrants. And what's the typical case of visceral larva migrants? We have a child to, who is exposed to cat or dog sandbox, again containing the eggs of cat or dog ascarids called Toxocara, and manifest with the same skin lesions that we mentioned, but also visceral involvement that's most commonly hepatomegaly, but can also include eye, that's visual symptoms. How is these larva migrants conditions diagnosed? usual diagnosed by ELISA and what is the treatment? Treatment of creeping eruption or cutaneous larva migrants is ivermectin or albendazole while treatment of toxocaral, visceral or ocular larva migrants is usually by albendazole and if severe we use corticosteroids. I would like to finish this episode by another case and this is a beer hunter, a bear hunter not a beer hunter, but a bear hunter who complains of muscle pain and exam shows periorbital edema. True or false, diagnosis is made by muscle biopsy. That is false, even though the diagnosis is most likely Trichinella spiralis. The gold standard for diagnosis is not muscle biopsy of the patient but the biopsy of the consumed meat, which is usually pork, but in this case we are dealing with a bear hunter. Remember, bear meat is a second common cause of Trichinella cyst infestation and Trichinellosis. Yes, we need to biopsy the meat product. Periorbital edema, in addition to myalgia, are the other symptoms of Trichinella spiralis. So we briefly discussed our nematodes, I mean as briefly as we could, 
and we have two categories intestinal and tissue nematodes the tissue nematodes are either filariasis transmitted by vectors or there are larva migrants and then we have intestinal nematodes that have eosinophilia except for the ones that stay in the large intestine and they have their own individual symptoms most of them are diagnosed by stool for ovine parasites and some of them require specific tests and this is the algorithm for the nematodes or roundworms thank you